Hi everyone, thank you for joining uh, my, my video for today. This is Sam, and I am excited to talk about some interesting stuff, um, which today I wanted the topic to be conservatism, and I just wanted to remind my viewers that I post these videos not knowing what I'm going to talk about beforehand, uh, but, you know, just kind of letting the thoughts emerge. And so I think... <clears throat> Maybe I'll start out by talking about why I discuss politics. Why do I care? Um, so first of all, people who disagree with my politics who are outside of the church would probably not appreciate my discussion of conservatism or uh, I, I consider myself not to be like a crazy right winger, um, but I think our political climate has gotten so out of control that people who are just even deviating a little bit from the left are considered to be alt-right. Uh, so I just want to start out by saying um, a year and a half ago, I was a registered Democrat. I wasn't actually planning on voting because I was pro-life. Um, and so since then, I kind of have, you know, started a journey and and like of, of investigation <clears throat> and so I basically decided that you know I was I think it was partly because it was a harder road it was people people really hated conservatives people hate Republicans and for some reason that vehement hatred I didn't see uh, I, I saw that as being wrong. I saw that as being not correct and and narrow-minded. And so I thought that that was one of the reasons, the catalyst for my thinking was the amount of uh, ferocity against people's political opposition uh, for just uttering the, the thought policing, the political correctness, the identity politics. And I had already start to I had already started to understand the context of cultural Marxism, and that was one of the catalyst moments for me because I did know what Marxism was. I was taught and trained in Marxism and sort of indoctrinated in college without really knowing what it was. And since this change, I've I've come to realize that Marxism doesn't convert people willingly. It converts people without them knowing it lots of times um, because all it is is, if I could say it simply, well, I think, first of all, it's a spiritual uh, movement. It's something that isn't just matter in motion. It has a darker energy behind it that is motivating people to hate each other to rise up against each other. And, and so it has, it's rooted in rebellion. It's rooted in viewing the world through oppressed and oppressor. And I've said this a lot of times, but it's convenient for me if I don't want to take personal responsibility and acknowledge the, own, the uh, evil that is in my own heart, then I can always just export the problem and say, hey, it's those people over there, or it's those people, they're the real problem. It's it's the Democrats, or it's the Republicans, or it's white people, or it's black people, or it's males, or it's females. And so it's, it's really a demonic philosophy that strips people of the sanctity of human life. And only the only value that they have is the value that is found in their group identities. And so it's just weighing and measuring people and looking at you are this therefore you are this um and so it really is a very narrow-minded way of thinking and it is a very complex philosophy that marx had constructed so but it it is narrow uh because even what marx was talking about which was more of a class um, conflict and class warfare was narrow-minded itself. Seeing rich people as, or people who have more than me, 
as evil and wicked it is such a wrong-headed position to be in. And today, people say, well, what about the really rich, the very rich, the, uh, the one percenters? They are the evil ones. But what about the two percenters, guys? And the three percenters and the four percenters. So, so that warring against the rich, just like warring against conservatives or people who are posting misinformation or whatever it might be, um, becomes such a vague terms to put people under. And I think that those things escape reality of human beings because we don't actually, if, if you're operating under that system and if you're seeing the world in that way, you're not actually taking into account that people are human beings with value and dignity and sanctity. And so now we're seeing uh, kind of the manifestation uh, with the rise of this new administration of all the fears that the conservatives had been sounding beforehand and we were called crazy we were called conspiracy theorists but now we're seeing uh, the administration start to monitor our free speech little by little and um, and continue to demonize and through the media endlessly without end to demonize people who disagree with them and so I, I just want to say my suspicions have been confirmed about the party in power. So I, that's why I, I'm doing this video, um, but I didn't want to talk too much about the opposition, so, but that's kind, of a <clears throat> that's kind of a backdrop. And when I say opposition, I mean ideological opposition. But I would be, I for one would be horrified if, uh, if my political opposition was being silenced, was not able to say whatever they wanted to say. Um, I would, that would terrify me um, because that, that would be a terrible sign for our country. Our country is built on the foundation of freedom of speech. Um, but now we're seeing our thoughts be regulated, we're seeing our rights be scrutinized. Like, hey, do we really need these? These rights are kind of dangerous, guys. If, if we have these rights, then this could happen. If we have these rights, then this could happen. Meanwhile, it seems like the left is creating rights out of thin air, right and left. They want new rights by the minute. Meanwhile, our rights are being attacked and scrutinized and discussed like hey do we really want to allow people to post things that we do not sanction on the internet so that's a dangerous time and that is confirmation of my decision to take that harder path of conservatism which i want to get into what i think that is because i don't have a deep rooted conservative philosophy or background um, but I do think it's important to understand even for the church, not to say, hey, all the church members need to become conserv politically conservative, but to say like, hey, we need to uh, really examine what is happening because the suppression of free speech is not godly. That is not something that is a good thing. The, uh, the abortion industry that the left supports is not, it's incompatible with Christianity. Socialism, what we've seen in the, in the history of communist countries is that they arose out of atheistic mindsets or, or even pantheistic mindsets. So socialism is riding on atheism. They're, that's what Marx was operating on. His biggest enemy was God. So socialism is incompatible with Christianity. And those are just three of the incompatibilities. So really, can you support that system? And you might say, you might say, oh, Sam, but wait, the Democratic Party isn't socialist. It's mainstream Democrat, or it's not Marxist. Well, like I've said in other videos, I have shown how it is uh, it, it may not be entirely Marxist, right? But it is operating on engines of Marxism. 
It's operating on uh, belief systems that are fueled by Marxism, which, so I, I, I did a little structure, which I'm going to do again. So let's say you have the party, the Democratic Party, and underneath it, you have the various platforms that they have. So racial justice, social justice, environmental justice, uh, gender justice, uh, and let's see, LGBTQ justice. So these all, all these movements and uh, racial, I think I said racial, right? So all these movements are, are functioning on certain theories and philosophies. So that have come in different waves throughout the generations. And with each wave, so this literally happens in all of them. So you have gender, uh, environmental, so eco-critical. Uh, so you have feminism, eco-critical, uh, critical race theory. Uh, sorry, I can't think of the other ones, but basically all of them, um, queer theory, all of them emerged throughout the decades in different waves. And with every wave, they became more radicalized. But each of these theories operate on the oppressed oppressor mindset that Marx, that Marx had instilled and infused into his theory. So there you have it. If those are the engines and the platforms for the Democratic Party, and they're all fused and they all grow up from this root, like if you think of a tree with all the various branches, they all merge from one root. And that root is based in Marxist economic class conflict theory, oppressed oppressor mindset viewing. And that's where we get. So, so we don't really have to understand everything about cultural Marxism and identity politics and all these theories. We just have to understand the root of it. From the bitter root grows the bitter fruit. And that's why we're seeing so much division and conflict in our society today is because it grows from the root of rebellion. Now, why do I talk about this as a Christian? Is it ungodly for me to be political as a Christian? No, it's not. It's important as Christians, not for us to, to uh, force people to think certain things, but to understand what philosophies are, what teachings do, what has emerged from teachings. Now, the repercussions of Marxist theory are overly or hugely undertaught in American academy. They, we are not taught the, the overarching negative impacts on the world, which are, I think over a hundred, I think the tally is over a hundred million lives lost. If you include, uh, China, China, communist China, um, the Soviet Union, uh, the, the Khmer Rouge and various other regimes that have emerged throughout the world based on this, this class conflict theory from which multiple, a multitude of other theories have emerged. And those theories are the engine for the Democratic Party. And these theories are all being pushed in the American Academy. And so these ideas are being taught to the people. No matter, I think pretty much everybody is under the impression of these things. Now, why was the horrible history, the, the, the most evil things that ever happened in the 20th century, even, even compared to Nazi Germany, uh, which you could argue Nazi Germany uh, largely, I mean, it was nat the National Socialist Party of Germany. So it, it was itself rooted in Marxist theory. So you could just probably add that to the various evils that were done in the name of Marxism. Why is this not taught? It's because people, it's what people believe. It's what, um, there was, there was a huge amount of respect among Western intellectuals for the ideas of communism. And there still is today. And so that's, that's why it's not taught to us. So that's why we don't have red flags going off. And that's why we don't actually take seriously the threat of communism, uh, and the threat of socialism and Marxism. And that's why today we have so many people who are claiming the status of socialists, um, because they want to, because they, it comes, lots of times it comes from a good place of wanting more, cha a cha more charitable, just, fair society. 
So anyways, this, this conversation has become more about Marxism and again, than about conservatism, but I do want to touch. So that's the backdrop that I'm putting it against. Um, and so conservatism isn't always like, it's not just Marxism, conservatism, but I think that's more of what it has become for us in America today, who, especially who have become new conservatives, um, we're doing it almost as a response to something that we have seen begin to emerge. And I would say lots of classical liberals and centrists are also responding to a wave of radical ideology that they see as a threat to society. And so they are becoming almost, um, I, I don't like using this word because it has such weird connotations today, but allies of the alt-right because they're, they're recognizing the crackdown on free speech. They're recognizing um, the indoctrination of people in the academy. They're recognizing uh, the radicalism of people uh, against anybody who thinks differently than them um, and the suppression of certain ideas. So we shouldn't be afraid of people sharing their ideas, sharing their thoughts, practicing their freedom of speech, and as soon as you are afraid of somebody else practicing their freedom of speech and you start attacking them because they have a different idea than you, that is a big red flag that you are becoming a part of a system that is not good. You, are become, you have been duped by the system. Uh, if anybody has... Um, Sorry, let me, let me just think about what I'm going to say here. If anybody thinks that people who believe something differently than them are the real threat to humanity right now, and it is not the top-down government control and restrictions that are tightening around the neck of the American people and the rejection of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, anybody who believes that is being duped. Anybody who believes that has become, in effect, a Marxist, oftentimes without even knowing it. <clears throat> and I say that lovingly so that we can recognize these things, but maybe start investigating, start learning about the negative aspects of Marxism, start, uh, start, start listening to people that are being rejected, because a lot of people that are being rejected right now are being rejected by Marxists because they reject Marxist philosophy. Um, read the Gulag Archipelago by uh, Solzhenitsyn. I, I can never pronounce his name. But that book is about the decool accusation. That book is about um, the the rise of communism in Soviet Union and the, the massive wave of destruction that it brought upon uh, millions and millions of people. Uh, the same thing happened in China. Um, so these radical ideologies do have impacts. Um, they do have... They have a, it has the most death we've ever seen as a human society. So there, there's the backdrop that I'm, I'm starting this conservative conversation on. That's what I wanted to get away from. I don't want to see other people that disagree with me or that have more money than me or who are a different color than me or are a different gender than me or have a different sexual preference than me as oppressors or who have a different religion than me. I don't want to go around and see them as oppressors and see myself as oppressed all the time. I think that's a terrible way. I, I would just be so depressed all the time if I was just caught in that victim mindedness. And so I think that Marxism largely does emerge from victim mindedness. So, so that's where I, that's what I wanted to get away from. And that's what I left and rejected. And it was so liberating. And frankly, I can't see that how, I can't see how Christians could support something like that. And we ought to keep in mind that that is the engine for the po political party in power. And their goals are to increase the restrictions. These, are, these restrictions aren't just temporary. And it's up to us as the American people, with the, with the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence in mind. It's up for us as the American people and also the First Amendment, to tell the truth. Even if it hurts, even if people call
call us Nazis for it, which I've, I've been called Nazis, a Nazi multiple times by people who have an ideology that is literally parallel to Nazism, which every single thing that Hitler believed and every single thing that the Nazis believe, I am on the opposite side of. I'm not a socialist. Um, I love Jewish people. Uh, I mean, I have such deep respect for Jews. <laughs> so uh, I'm a Christian. So so they wanted to restrict the rights of the church. They wanted to, and, and I'm an Orthodox Christian. So I would have rejected Nazi ideology being infused into the church um, and changing our theology to, to integrate with Nazi ideology. Let's see, what else? Um, I'm anti-eugenicist. I'm pro-life. Uh, the the, the pro-choice movement in the abortion industry, industry rose out of the eugenics movement. Mar Margaret Sanger was a vicious, rabid eugenicist whose life philosophy was parallel with Hitler's. So every, like literally everything that the Nazis believe, most conservatives believe the absolute opposite. And people who are socialists, who are oftentimes anti-Israel, who are oftentimes pro-choice, who are pro-abortion industry. Um, and let's see, what else? Uh, so lots of times people who are the most uh, vehemently in all of those things are the ones who are starting riots. They're the Antifas. They're the ones who are calling everybody Nazis who disagree with them. Oh yeah, that's that's another thing. Forced, uh, forced speech, restriction of civil liberties. That was something the Nazis did. I'm for freedom of speech and I'm for smaller government. Uh, they were for bigger government, right? More government power. Uh, give me all the power to the Fuhrer. So there you go. Like, I mean, I don't know how much clearer it has to be uh, that our ideologies don't line up. And maybe if that's you and you're saying, wait, like, well, my ideologies line up with kind of some of those things. Uh, this is not to say like you're a Nazi, obviously. I would not, I would not go around labeling people Nazis. Um, so that's the thing. We're not calling people, <laughs> people Nazis, but we're getting slandered and ridiculed and labeled Nazis all the time. And that's another problem with what the left is doing with that label of Nazis, because they see Nazis as literally somebody who can be killed and it be a, an act of good. Um, I actually was told by a friend who is very far on the left, although he doesn't claim to be on the left, he says that he doesn't fit into the political spectrum. But he said that killing Nazis can be a good thing. And I'm like, well, dude, what's a Nazi? And, and he literally doesn't know what a Nazi is. He doesn't know what they believe. And so when a Nazi is just anybody who agrees or uh, disagrees with you, then you can use that term to pin on anybody who disagrees with you. And what, now you can like deliver them over to the state to be sent to a prison or a concentration camp or you can punch them or you can hit them in the head with a brick. And, and it's a good thing, it's an act of justice. You see the problem? So these terms that are used to put people into boxes are just extremely vague and they're interchangeable based on whoever, whatever people want it to be at the time. So anyways, my, conserv my conservatism emerges from that and the dangers that I saw, the warnings that I saw. So it was largely a reactionary, um, a reactionary decision on my part. But I also believe that conservatism recognizes the foundations that we have. So I believe in uh, a lot of the Proverbs that Solomon spoke about and the wisdom that he said, listen to the wisdom of your parents. Honor your father and mother, right? That's one of the Ten Commandments. Um, but like, people nowadays want to reject their parents and reject the teachings that they've been taught. So I look to the wisdom of my parents as a large part of my foundation as a human being. And if I was to reject that foundation and just move forward, um, it could lead, to, lead me to making foolish decisions in the future. So what I'm saying is uh, conservatism always has a notion of the background that we came from, knowing where we're headed forward. So it's not saying we don't ever want to progress, because progressing can be a good thing 
if it's done with the right motivations, but also recognizing problems and things in the past that we don't want to return to. It's like coming out of an addiction. If you come out of an addiction, you're not going to want to go back into that addiction. Or if you're on a diet, you don't want to eat a bunch of donuts because it's going to make you fat. You want to eat healthy meals. So you're remembering the pain of the past so that you can move forward into a more just, more fair future that is actually more akin to the utopia that uh, Marx was talking about because it's recognizing wisdom of, of understanding the foundation. <clears throat> Whereas I, I, I see the alternative ideology as wanting to tear down the entire foundation and build a structure on no foundation. And first of all, I have to say that it all has to do with God's sovereignty. God is the one who allows nations to exist. As a Christian, I believe that. God is the, we might say that we can, we might build things on our own, but ultimately God is the one who will make it flourish and bless it or take away its, ex, its ability to flourish and be blessed. Um, so what you saw with these nations is when they pulled God out of it, when they started attacking and persecuting the church, which I'm going to show you this book. This is about the communist torture of Christians um, in in Romania and in Russia, uh, as well as, you know, you have this one as well, the Gulag Archipelago. Um, these books really go into great detail about what happens when you pull God out of a society and you start uh, really attacking Christians. Um, so it just leads to evil you can't even speak of. You can't even talk about it or you'll go insane. So much evil. Uh, so Christians are the hev most heavily per heavily persecuted group on the planet. And they were last century too. You had, you had millions of Christians being tortured, being imprisoned, being murdered in communist countries. So, I mean, but that just doesn't, it's never talked about. It's never brought up. Uh, so I think, I think that recognition of like, God is the one who helps us to establish our foundation. And if we pull God out of everything, then he will let us have our way, but we will be allowed to carry out the evil desires of our heart as human beings. So conservatism largely acknowledges not a vision of humans having always a tendency of good, but that human beings are flawed. And, and we, we operate from a tragic vision that recognizes a realistic view of things, that there is a human condition and that human beings do have a great capacity for evil, not just them in the 20th century, but us now, today. And if we don't recognize those things, we can be, if we don't remember the things that happened in the past, we can, like you said, you, like you know the, the maxim, be doomed to repeat those failures in the future. So God wants us to recognize that wisdom, the wisdom of the foundation, uh, the foundation of the founding fathers, right? The foundation of our parents and what they've taught us. Um, the foundation of God's word, moreover, for, for us as Christians, and really understanding that. And that's, I think, a problem, and this is pretty controversial, with conservatism, apart from, apart from uh, an overarching structure. It's like, how do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of any foundation? How do you make sense of anything um, being more than what we, what we just say is all good for the moment? Um, I think it's really hard to make sense of uh, conservatism and and operating in a system and not just progressing for progress's sake if there is no sovereign God. I, and I, I really, I would love to hear somebody's insight on that because I know there are lots of really smart conservatives who, are, who know much more about conservatism than me that are atheists. Um, but... I just don't see, even Solzhenitsyn recognized, he said, after 50 years of studying the, the communist uh, societies, 
he he recognized that it was because people had forgotten God is why all this had happened. So you could say that the biggest expert on the evils of communism, the evils of a godless society, an atheist society, uh, and that's what it was, that's what it had emerged from. You could say the biggest expert on that, his thesis, was that God was pulled out, therefore everything else crumbled. That was his thesis out of, out of 50 years of studying that. So I just, I just wonder, like, where do you get the foundation if not from God, if not from the author of reality? And so that's, that's my question. Uh, and so conservatism is, yeah, it's moving forward, but it's also recognizing why we're moving forward and what we don't want to move forward towards because we could be moving forward towards a giant cliff that we think is the utopia, but it's not. The wide road to destruction, which is what the communists found in Russia. So anyways, that's those are some of the reasons why I'm a conservative now. Um, it was largely a reactionary decision. Uh, it was largely um, seeing so much hate um, and, and I, I do believe that we can stand up for the truth and, and ignore the lies that we are being told daily by the media and by, um, by this administration that we can reject the crackdown on freedom of speech, even people on the left for their, their friends and family on the right to say, Hey, you know, this is not right. This is not, this is not the type of liberal that I am. Because liberal in its word, in its very word, has the idea of freedom. So it is an anti-liberal measure to take away people's basic freedoms and rights. That is illiberal. That is totalitarian. Uh, and, and I don't care where you are on the political spectrum. That is just, that's not a something you should be in support of. So anyways, I hope this video was helpful for everybody more political discussion today, but like, share, subscribe if you found it helpful, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless you.